Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is June 20th, 2011, and my guest is David Skeel, the S. Samuel Arsht Professor of Corporate Law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. David, welcome to Econ Talk. Well, thanks for having me. Our topic today is bankruptcy, and in particular, the bailouts of General Motors and Chrysler and their interaction with bankruptcy law. The most optimistic view of those bailouts is that these were crucial. They saved hundreds of thousands of jobs, uh, if not the direct employee of GM and Chrysler, their suppliers. Uh, it's going to cost taxpayers very little. We might get all of our money back. If not, we'll get most of it back. And you disagree on a number of counts. What's wrong with this optimistic view? Well, there are lots of things that are wrong with it. Almost each phrase of your sentence I would disagree with well, in one go, way or another. Let's go one by one. Um, well, I won't remember the particular <laughs> order, but uh, one point you made, which is, is a very common argument, is that uh, the, the car companies could not have been restructured in any other way. It had to be done the way it was done. Uh, I don't believe that's true. I think uh, something much closer to, to an ordinary bankruptcy, and, and we can get um, into what was non-ordinary about about these transactions, but something closer to an ordinary bankruptcy could have been used to restructure them. The idea which uh, the administration and advocate of the of the bailout seem to be backing away from a little bit now that the bailouts were almost cost free or there wasn't a significant cost to to taxpayers I think is is very inaccurate. Uh, even the administration now acknowledges that they're likely to cost at least fourteen billion dollars. And this is leaving out some very significant costs that weren't um, were not in the form of direct funds to um, to the car company. So um, the idea that this had to be done, nothing else could have been done. Almost everything about it about that, I think, is quite debatable. Well, I think the you know fourteen billion that's like zero. I guess that would be one argument, but I. I'm on the other side. I say it's not zero. But let, let's go to the alternative uh, bankruptcy proceeding because I think the very option of bankruptcy is forgotten by a lot of people. When you talk casually with folks who are not well-informed, which would include me because uh, this is a, a little bit of, a, of an arcane topic, bankruptcy law, I think the way it's usually described is, well, the companies were going to die – or they'd be saved. I mean, in fact, there was this alternative of a, quote, ordinary bankruptcy. Describe how that would have worked or might have worked if that had been put on the table. An ordinary bankruptcy? Yes. Um, well, an, an ordinary bankruptcy is a, a bankruptcy where the company, in this case, one of the car companies, files for bankruptcy. When they file for bankruptcy, their creditors are required to stop trying to collect what they're owed. The parties get together, they negotiate over the terms of a reorganization plan over a period of time, which can be anything from a month or two to much longer than that. And then when they've more or less agreed on the terms of a reorganization plan, there's a vote. Each class of creditors and shareholders votes on the plan. And if enough of the creditors or shareholders in each given class vote yes, then the plan is, is confirmed. That's the normal bankruptcy process that we've used in this country for, um, for well over 100 years. And that negotiation, that the, the working out of that plan is adjudicated by a, by a bankruptcy judge? By, how, how does, what determines what gets voted on? Well, what gets what determines what gets voted on in the first instance is the debtor, which means the managers of the company that is in bankruptcy. For the, the beginning of the case, at least, for the first four months of the case, and usually a bit longer than that, only the managers can propose a reorganization plan. So 
they're the ones who are making the decisions in theory. Obviously, those decisions are policed in various ways. They have to negotiate with uh, with creditors. You don't want to uh, propose a plan that nobody's going to approve. It may also be that the judge comes into the picture at various points, and the judge is, as you suggested, a bankruptcy judge um, who oversees uh, the case. But one thing that people often... Um, misunderstand about bankruptcy is it, it's not ordinarily the bankruptcy judge who's making the decisions. In a normal bankruptcy case, the bankruptcy judge is much more like a referee or an umpire. They're, they're calling the balls and strikes. They're not making the actual business decisions. So they can say this offer doesn't comply with such and such? or That's right. They can say it's not in good faith or it's not properly treating a creditor or there are any number of of issues that can come up, but the the basic terms of the restructuring are largely determined by the parties themselves in in a normal bankruptcy case, and I, so, I need to keep putting that caveat on. Proposed by management with the veto power of, of the creditors, that is, the man- management has to gain the acceptance of the creditors of the plan. That's right. So let's take a step back. Why would you be in that situation to start with, and what determines – whether a business is viable or not. Again, I think most people assumed incorrectly as, as far as I understand it. And let's let's focus on GM because it's the larger one. Most people just assume, well, GM is they're going to go out of business and then all their suppliers are going to go out of business. And as an economist, my first thought is, well, if they go out of business, there's going to be people who are going to be buying their cars. They're going to buy other people's cars. Those other people are going to need suppliers too. And so the, these so-called second and third multiplier effects are going to be quite small. But put that to the side, the point is is that GM was a viable enterprise, but they could not meet their commitments uh, on a particular day. That is, they owed money that they could not um, they could not meet all the obligations that they owed. Is that a correct way to describe their situation? That is a helpful way to put it, I think, so that if you ask the question, what kind of company might file for bankruptcy and be restructured and come out perfectly healthy, one answer would be if you have a company that is a perfectly viable enterprise, uh, that's a, a relatively healthy company operationally, but simply has too much debt. It just has more debt than it's able to um, to repay. That's the classic example of a company that can reorganize in bankruptcy. And, and the terms you economists often use, it is a company that is financially distressed, but not economically distressed. Its, it's underlying business um, is sound. And with General Motors in particular, that was quite clearly the case. With, with Chrysler, it was, and truth be told still is, more of a close call, whether there's an enterprise there that, that truly can survive for the long haul. But with General Motors, it, it was quite clear that it, it was a perfectly viable company that had too much debt and simply had an unsustainable cost structure. It's hard to you – know, obviously, these are technical definitions of viable, solvent, um, too much debt. The part that's strange about it is that if, if I live be I, if I'm a company that lives beyond its means, uh, it's hard to understand what it means that there's a viable business model. I guess you could argue that it it squandered its past borrowings, but its current offerings to consumers, say, are large enough to cover the cost of producing the cars. But there's a set of promises made in the past, either to debtors or to past workers, and I want to add that in because that's going to I know be important in the story. So when we talk about creditors and debtors, we're really talking about wide array of promises that GM had made in the past that it was not able to honor all of in the present. Is that correct? That is correct, Um, and and that's a good explanation of how they could have too much debt and yet have a business that uh, that appears to be worth saving. So if you don't know any economics and you don't know any finance and you just hear that somebody's got too much debt, your first thought is, well – Everybody should get a prorated share. So if, if, if I've got 90% of the money on hand to pay back my debtors of, of the 100% that I owe, everybody's going to take a haircut and get 0.9 of, of what they were promised, and we'll all go on down the road for, happy, and that's the best they can do because I don't have enough. And so 
but that's not the way it works because there's 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 a line and and there's a promise in advance of who gets to go in line correct uh that is correct uh and we can go into the line if yeah, you let's would go like into it. to. I let's mean, go the, into it. So talk about who gets who. So people get dibs. They they get first crack, uh, and some people are, are privileged above others because when they made the investment, uh, that was part of the reason they're willing to do it because they were told that they would be in a certain place in the lines. So what is the what is the in a in an ordinary bankruptcy. Who gets first claim on the assets? Well, the, the principal line, and, and there are various small lines, but the principal line is between priority creditors, and in particular priority creditors who have taken collateral for what they are owed on the one hand, and then on the other hand, general creditors. So a, a senior lender that has lent money to the debtor has taken back collateral to secure repayment. That may be real estate, it may be dealerships, it Equipment. may be you know, car inventory. That creditor ordinarily gets paid in first, it gets paid first, and creditors who have not taken collateral, who are, are referred to as general creditors or general unsecured creditors, they usually come next. That's that's the biggest line in a bankruptcy case. Now, th- there's a special case, which is not right now what we're talking about, which is that the firm's not viable at all. So in that case, the assets get sold off and the line gets paid off according to where you are in line. And when they run out of assets, that's it. You're stuck. This would be something like Lehman Brothers, right? Lehman Brothers is dead. It's gone. It's not a going concern. And the people who Lehman owed money to, some are going to get all that they were promised. Some are going to get a fraction and some are going to get zero, correct? That's correct. And let me just – let me throw in one footnote as well. The fact that a financial institution institution like Lehman is sold – um, uh, in bankruptcy rather than restructured is not, not necessarily a failing of the bankruptcy process. So when we say a successful bankruptcy is one where the company is reorganized, that's a little bit inaccurate. I think what you would want to say is a successful bankruptcy is a bankruptcy where the financial uh, distress is dealt with well. So that if it's the kind of company that can be restructured and is viable in its current form, you you would hope to see a reorganization. If it's the kind of company that for whatever reason you you can't restructure in that way and it makes more sense to sell it, um, that can be a successful bankruptcy as well. So in the case of GM, what do you think would have happened had the Bush and Obama administration stayed out of it, the natural legal process had gone forward, uh, GM would have woken up one day with an inability to honor all of its promises, would have declared bankruptcy, confronted its creditors, and what might that reorganization have looked like? Do we have any idea? Well, we it, it obviously is simply speculative, but it it would have looked the way we were describing earlier. It would have been a, a negotiated restructuring. GM had already been negotiating with all of its creditors uh, well before it filed for bankruptcy. Would have led to a proposed reorganization and and a vote. Um, so that's that's what the process would look like. There are some questions about how it would have worked. One big question um, is whether General Motors would have been able to borrow money to finance the process. That uh, A big company in bankruptcy typically is going to have to borrow money to, um, to fund its operations while it's restructuring. I think GM probably could have borrowed from private creditors, um, even in late 2008, 2009, which was in the middle of the credit crunch, obviously. Um, I think there's a possibility that they would not have have been able to um, to borrow money, and and that's the point at which um, it would make sense potentially for the government to to uh, to serve as lender. In my view, it would have made more sense for the government to lend the money without um, without micromanaging the the process the way they did and simply acting um, more as an arm's length uh, uh, an arm's length lender um, than it did. So to summarize all of that, if we'd done a normal bankruptcy, 
Ideally, what would have happened is General Motors would have borrowed money from private creditors, they would have renegotiated their obligations, and they would have confirmed a reorganization plan probably quite quickly. It probably would have been a matter of months, not a matter of, of years, because it was clear they needed to restructure um, in in short order. The alternative scenario would have been General Motors can't find financing, does need to tap the federal government for financing, but I still think you get a, or you could have gotten a process that looked quite a bit different from the process the government used. Now, when you talk about restructuring, one way that firms restructure is they sell off a division that isn't that isn't profitable. That would be an obvious way. You might close down some uh, aspects of your business, uh, which GM did, if I remember correctly, they they closed down some dealers. That's uh, right. And I'm not. I mean, we'll come back to this, but it wasn't clear to me that in the normal course of legal proceedings, they'd have been able to do that in a normal bankruptcy proceed, proceedings. But that was those would be the two ways that that a firm would respond. The third issue would be uh, promises made to to past employees, the union, et cetera. And I think. The most provocative part of your argument is that the way that the government intervened in an ad hoc way rather than as a letting bankruptcy proceed and if necessary being a lender of last resort, uh, instead they proceeded to put, appoint a car czar, uh, Steve Ratner, w- which allowed the government to change uh, who got what in, in the – compared to what a bankruptcy proceeding would have done, in particular that the unions did better than they would have done. So what's what's the evidence for that, and what's the nature of that claim? Um, this may require a series of answers, but the, uh, the short answer um, is that, that what looks problematic about the result in, in Chrysler and in GM is that in Chrysler, senior lenders were paid only a small portion of what they were owed. They were paid 29 cents on the dollar, and yet the um, the employees, particularly the Chrysler retirees, got a much, much bigger percentage of their obligations paid and, and looked to have been paid almost um, in full or something close um, to in full. So when you look at Chrysler um, in particular, it looks like we've inverted the normal priorities, that the senior creditors didn't get paid in full, and, and yet a lower priority creditor um, got paid either in full or something close to in full. In General Motors, it's not quite as dramatic. In General Motors, the senior creditors did get paid in full, but uh, but many of the um, the junior creditors, the unsecured creditors, got pennies on the dollar, ten or twelve cents on the dollar, while again the union um, uh, the unionized retirees got got something that was much bigger. So in that case, it looked like uh, the employees were getting more than other unsecured creditors. So in each, in each case, it looks problematic from the perspective of normal bankruptcy priorities. Now, um, we don't know for certain whether priorities were violated, and, and hopefully we can get into exactly um, why that is. There's, a, there's another big piece to the, um, to the puzzle, and that is that relates to the fact that these cases were structured not as normal bankruptcies, um, but as sales. Okay, we'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. I, I just have to mention I, I never blogged on this uh, at Cafe Hayek, my blog, but I, 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 it's sitting in a pile somewhere. It's in a, it's in a tab uh, on, <laughs> to on Cro- yeah, my to be blogged tab on, on Chrome or, or uh, Firefox, uh, which is a. Uh, a, a Washington Post unsigned editorial where they wondered whether politics might have had something to do with the uh, decision to intervene in this way. And of course, politics had something to do. I mean, it's a bizarre question for a newspaper headquartered in the nation's capital to wonder whether this was a political decision. So of course it was. But but the question remains, uh, what evidence do we have from past bankruptcy proceedings that – would suggest that this was something out of the ordinary. In other words, let's take the GM case. Uh, 
So junior creditors got pennies on the dollar, 10, 12 cents. Retirees got more. Couldn't that have emerged from a bankruptcy proceeding, uh, a more traditional, it straightforward could. one? It could, and that's why, um, that's why I put the caveat at the end that, uh, that where the, the real problem is is the way the bankruptcy was uh, was structured, and, and maybe I'll just jump into that. Yeah, talk about that. Talk really quickly. Yeah, what you, happened? You, no, you go can ahead. Steer me away if, if no, no. it gets too technical. Go ahead. Um, so the way the the bankruptcies were structured uh, was as sales, rather than renegotiating the terms of their obligations and proposing a reorganization plan. What the government did in each case is purported to sell all of the assets to a, a new entity, um, new Chrysler in the Chrysler case, new GM, as they were colloquially referred to and in the General Motors case, and then distributed, uh, distributed the proceeds of the so-called sales to, um, to the old creditors. So they were structured as sales. The way that... Whose idea was that? Pardon? That's, that's creative. It is creative. Whose it's idea not was that? remotely unheard of. This, okay. this does happen regularly in bankruptcy cases. What was unusual about it was the size of the companies that were being sold. Um, normally, when you sell a company in in bankruptcy, you're selling an appreciably smaller um, smaller company. When you get a company the size of General Motors or Chrysler, in the past, they have almost always, with with just one or two major exceptions, been restructured under the normal bankruptcy route. So the the first really clever thing the government did, and this this was clever, but I I believe it was ultimately too clever, um, was to take this sale technique and apply it to a kind of company where it it ordinarily um, isn't applied. So the way, way this could have been completely kosher is... If this were a wide open auction for Chrysler's and GM's assets and the price that the government set on the assets, which in, in Chrysler, um, which is the case I've, I've written most about, um, was $2 billion, if there were a wide open a, uh, auction and $2, million, or $2 billion were the, the best price available for the Chrysler uh, assets, then what was done would be defensible. And the way it would be defensible is uh, what the government was, would say is we paid full value for these assets, um, $2 billion. The $2 billion was used to pay the senior creditors. It only gave them $0.29 cents on the dollar, but it, it was used to pay the senior creditors. So the proceeds all went to the senior creditors. And then the argument is the bankruptcy case, old Chrysler, isn't actually paying the employees and the other favored creditors. The, the employees and other favored creditors are being paid by the new company, by new Chrysler. Once new Chrysler has bought the assets fair and square and has paid full value for them, it's entitled to do whatever it wants. If it wants to pay the old employees, it can pay the old employees. If it wants to pay the old trade creditors who also were paid, it can pay the old trade creditors. That's the argument, and it's a plausible argument. The problem is that these cases were anything but wide open auctions. They were basically structured so that uh, essentially nobody else could bid. Um, And the way that was done is in each case uh the there was an auction but it was subject to what was known what was called a qualified bidder requirement to be a qualified bidder and to be sure you would be able to participate in the auction you um you could you could do anything you wanted to do you could offer to buy just a piece of Chrysler you could offer to buy say the Jeep division uh, as i mentioned in the in the article for 2.5 billion dollars and and not buy anything else um you could do that as long as you also promised to do precisely what the government did, as long as you promised mm-hmm. to pay off the employees, also pay off um, the trade creditors. So to, to sum all that up, it was structured so that nobody could make a bid unless they agreed to do everything the government wanted to do, which was to protect the employees and protect um, the trade creditors, which obviously is not a real auction at all. 
So again, who do you think – who was creating all this? Who – is this the Justice Department? Who, what what part of the government or was it some – I don't know. Where did that come from? It's very creative again. It's, it's very creative. It, it, at that point, it's, it is, however, beyond creative. At that point, we have a sham auction. Yeah, it's well, a sham yeah. sale. This isn't really a sale. Basically, what the government is doing is saying, we will give some money to the old creditors, and we're taking the assets, um, and we're deciding what, what to do with them. Um, who decided? Uh, it was the auto task force, I think. I think, uh, obviously, the president was involved in the decision making they also were advised by a number of outside um, advisors including bankruptcy lawyers investment bankers and folks like that so I, uh, I don't, we don't have know. the minutes of those meetings. I know. I would love to have yeah. those minutes. And the one thing, the one thing that uh, just mystifies me is is why they made it a sham auction. Why they didn't have a real auction? Because I I think the reality is it would have been tough for anybody to outbid the government. You know, the government's fingerprints were all over these transactions. Why they didn't at least have a legitimate auction is just mystifying to me, and and I would love to know whose idea that was. Um, I, I think what happened is is they just felt like they had to dictate the terms, and they couldn't take any chances that they would lose control of the process in any way, and they were they were willing to abuse the bankruptcy rules to do that. I, I can't help but think of two things as you describe that. One is uh, the phrase that I don't know if anyone out there listening has the same thought, but I keep thinking of New Coke. When I hear New GM and New Chrysler, I think of New Coke, a product launch that didn't make it. Um, <laughs> I think but, pro- probably the government does not want you to be uh, <laughs> to have that sequence no. of thoughts. They could just call it the Edsel, the new company. But the other the other thought I had is it, it's slightly reminiscent. It's not quite – it's similar but not quite the same to the, uh, the March 17th Bear Stearns decision when – over the weekend, on the grounds that we didn't have time to do anything differently, the government decided that Bear Stearns would be purchased by J.P. Morgan Chase for ten dollars uh, a share. But well, actually, they decided initially two dollars. Two dollars, but that was too embarrassing, so they raised it to ten, and then they said, "We'll we'll take over uh, twenty nine or thirty two billion dollars worth of toxic assets because you can't evaluate these over the weekend." You don't have time, and uh, we'll, we understand that, that that that's difficult to do in 72 hours or re- maybe 48. So therefore, we have to have a sham transaction, which is a sweetheart deal rather than an auction, which would be the obvious thing to do in that setting would be to say, well, we don't know what it's worth. I don't know if it's worth 10 or 2, or maybe somebody would be willing to eat those assets that are potentially toxic. Nobody knew at the time. And instead, we were told there was no choice. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase is the only viable bidder. They have to buy it. Here's the price. And to make it easy for them, we're going to give them this. Uh, we're going to guarantee these assets that, oh, and don't worry, Mr. Taxpayer, Mrs. Taxpayer, Ms. Taxpayer. Uh, you might make money on these assets anyway. It, it'll all turn out okay. Um, the other part that strikes me as similar is the opacity, the non-transparency of this process to the average person. So when you when you say you're mystified by why this took place, the average person has zero idea, including someone like myself who's somewhat uh, educated and and somewhat interested in the, in these incentive issues and public policy. I didn't get into the details of what actually happens. Why I'm talking to you. So one of the virtues of this, I think, from the government's perspective, from the policymakers' perspective, is it's real complicated. Bankruptcy, eyes glaze over. Oh yeah, I guess the government saved the companies. That's it. The details, very, very few people followed them. You followed them, and you're mystified. Uh, the rest of the people are just nodding along, saying they didn't have a choice. They had to do it, and I guess it turned out okay. That's, I think, the average uh, response. So, Or the average – there's another response that's somewhat typical, which is, gee, this sounds like they nationalized the car companies. That doesn't sound very good. I'm against it. So they're, you know, they're, they're different views. Some were pragmatic, some were ideological or dogmatic, but – but I don't think very many people were down in the trenches with those details. So it's, I'm glad to know them and glad to spread them as widely as, as the listenership of this program.
Well, I, um, well, I'm glad you're you're uh, happy to, to spread them as well because I think that's very important, yeah. and I, I really agree with uh, with a number of things you just said, including the analogy to Bear Stearns in in both transactions. There was a real "you have to trust us" quality, and, and when I say "you have to trust us," um, uh, it's really um, it, it, you have no choice. You, know, you just you just have to trust us. We know what we're doing. We're really smart. Um, you don't need to know about. Uh, and the alternative, uh, the alternative is apocalypse. It's, it's exactly catastrophe. And, um, and another another analogy between the transactions is in each case. The government really cut corners with rule of law principles. So I've been talking about the um, the way corners were cut with bankruptcy rules, with the car bailouts, with Bear Stearns corporate law rules. Um, corporate law corners were cut. That that transaction was structured in a way that it made it made it impossible for another bidder to come along. If if there were some other bidder that were willing to pay more than J P Morgan was going to pay for Bear Stearns. Was and and this was done in a way that almost certainly cannot be rec- reconciled with ordinary corporate um, corporate law. So in each case, there was this argument: you just have to trust us. The world is going to fall apart if we don't do what we do. And um, and in addition, there was a willingness to to really bend the rules in a, in a very for me worrisome way in order to ch- achieve these results. Yeah, and I, I I concede. I always think it's important to mention. I'm willing to concede the possibility that the players were actually uh, believe they drank the Kool Aid. They really thought that they were on the edge of catastrophe, the edge of an abyss. It, they may they there may have been a real sense of panic. Um, I just don't think that's a good reason to justify violating the rule of law or the Constitution or creating new things that the Fed's never done before. Uh, you're, you're a corporate law expert and scholar. So you notice those uh, violations. I look at the Fed's mission. Uh, It doesn't really say anywhere that the Fed's job is to make sure that creditors of large financial institutions who made bad bets should always get all their money back. That just really bugs me as a principle of of governance of of the Fed. But you're suggesting there were other aspects of, of the process that were inappropriate. I, I absolutely am suggesting that, and, and I agree with you that the people who were making these decisions, which were primarily uh, Ben Bernanke at the Fed and, and uh, back in the Bear Stearns period, Paulson. Uh, it was Paulson, Geithner. later later Geithner. But no, Geithner, Geithner at, as the head of the New York Fed yeah, was Geithner, very involved. Yeah, he was involved as head of the New York Fed at, at the Bear Stearns point. I absolutely believe that they thought they were doing the right thing. That I, I, I don't have any um, any doubt that they believed they were doing what was best for the country and for the world. Um, but I think the way they went about doing what they did shows just how important rule of law principles are. You know, that um, they may be wrong about uh, about what they're doing. There's a reason those particular rules are in place and. There's there's a real cost to violating them, even in a crisis. Yeah, totally agree. Now let's turn to the uh, next question, which I also which also gets um, uh, whitewashed quite a bit through its lack of transparency, which is the uh, the cost uh, of the of the bailouts. And I'm gonna, I put that word in sort of scare quotes there um, when I said cost because for reasons. Um, I think for all kinds of reasons, the cost of these decisions is usually meant to mean the cost of the taxpayer, right? Uh, out of pocket costs. I think that's the wrong measure. We'll come back to that. Yeah, I but agree with you. But let's start with that. Uh, this, this, the view is the the way it's written about these days in the in the business press is is something like the government still owns some shares of, of various companies. You know, if the price goes up enough. The taxpayer will if, – if the value of the stock goes up enough, if GM or AIG in another case, if they create enough value, the taxpayers will get their money back. And, and the whole thing will just be a, a wash allegedly because um, it's true. It was a gamble, but it turned out OK and, and the taxpayer was made whole. We'll come back at the, in a little bit about why that's the – I think that's the wrong metric. But 
and, and I know you agree with that. But let's just talk about the fact of how – of whether the taxpayer is going to be made whole uh, and the way it's being accounted for in the in the most of these discussions. Well, if you start with with the metric that the government wants to use and that people often use, what to what extent are taxpayers on the hook for this? What are they going to end up paying? What you would say is that it now looks like the the car bailouts will cost about fourteen billion dollars that they'll be somewhere in the the range of fourteen billion dollars. Those numbers may change, but um, that that will not end up getting repaid even after all the government's general Motors and Chrysler stock is sold uh, et cetera um, to that, if, if you're trying to get an accurate number, you would need to add the other cost to taxpayers of the bailouts that don't figure in, um, in the direct loans by the government. And the, and the cost that uh, I have focused on in my work is that the Treasury basically uh, adjusted the tax rules to give General Motors a special break um, with respect to its taxes. That is a break that could be worth as much as $45 billion in tax write-offs. Um, and you know when you run that through the 28 percent corporate level tax is probably in the 12 or 13 billion dollar range. So, so basically, what happened is uh, General Motors uh, had a lot of tax losses um, that, depending on how the transaction was structured, might disappear, um, and and depending on uh, whether the government held on to its stock or sold its stock. Treasury essentially said, don't worry about what you do, we're going to let you have um, these tax write-offs, which ends up um, saving General Motors uh, about 12 or $13 billion. So, so you need to be taking into account those kinds of costs as well, things that the government did that took money from taxpayers, essentially gave it to General Motors or Chrysler, even though it wasn't a direct loan. It was a regulatory intervention, or in this case, a non-intervention. It's not, you know, as you're speaking, you can't see this because we're on the uh, we're on a podcast. But I'm shaking my head in <laughs> sorrow. It's a mournful head shaking. I'm trying to think of the analogy. So the analogy would be: I'm having a tough time. Uh, I get audited by the IRS, and I got a big tax bill. And they say, "Well, what did you? You know, what are some things you spent money on?" Well, you know. I have a little problem. Uh, you know, I, I really like electronics and gadgets, so I bought a lot of. You know, I bought the new iPad, and I bought a new MacBook Pro, and I bought some nice equipment for my house to play music through. And can we just make that tax deductible just this year? Oh, sure. <laughs> right. That's you're having a tough time, and you're a nice guy. We like you. This year, that's tax deductible. I mean, it's 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 a grotesque corruption. In fact, the, the, you know what? And I, again, I hate to. To bring up these these parallels, or maybe I don't hate to. I actually I like it. it, it they're they're very. It's very important to point these out. You know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac they bought mortgages from mortgage originators and and guaranteed the payment to the people who held the bonds that had those mortgages in them. They did a bunch of other things as well. Right. But one of the and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac until fall of two thousand and eight were private private. Quasi private firms. They had stockholders, they had bondholders like normal companies. And in the provisions of those purchases, when they would purchase a, a, a mortgage from, say, Countrywide or Wells Fargo or Bank of America, there, were, there was a, a condition on those purchases, which was basically if those mortgages were issued in a fraudulent way or were not in compliance with Fannie and Freddie's regulations, Fannie and Freddie would not be on the hook for the for the fact that the payments were made, but the originators would be because there's always the potential for fraud, and that was a contractual arrangement between Fannie Mae and its originators. Well, now that the government is the conservator, whatever that means, you can tell me literally what it means, but basically running Fannie and Freddie. Yeah, they've taken over. They've said, well, you know, we're not going to really try to collect that st- because we're – I don't know. I, I, why? Because the banks are our friends? I, it, it's mind-boggling. What this has done to contractual relationships. So similarly, yeah, you, know, you made a bunch of decisions with tax consequences. If you're GM, you get a do-over. It just doesn't 
mystify is the right word. It is mystifying. It is not so mystifying, really. It's political, but it's it's disturbing. It's deeply disturbing. I agree completely, and I I, I really think as well that that feeds into the general impression that Wall Street has been bailed out, is being bailed out, and the little guy really isn't being helped. And um, that's been an impression throughout the crisis, and I really think there's something to it. And when you, you start suggesting that the rules apply differently for different people, I, I think it really erodes the, the economic morality um, uh, in, and erodes it in a way that, that really has effects everywhere. I, I think it's just terrible, yeah. um, that, that kind of behavior, and there has been a lot of it during the crisis. Let's turn to the, the real cost then because I think this is what we're starting to get into uh, the real cost to me uh, are that when your company is um, doing a bad job either in managing itself or producing good products that people want to buy where the price exceeds the cost of producing them, instead of trying to do better, you can go to Washington if you're politically powerful and you can uh, get a do-over. Uh, you focus on a different issue, which is the credit uh, opportunities that are available to companies. Right, and I think those are both issues. So, um, so just to to elaborate a little bit on your issue, it, if this is the way the government deals with private industry, what it suggests that is that a favored companies get do-overs, um, and they're not policed by the market in the same way as everybody else. And that seems problematic, even from the perspective of, of the favored company, that we just shouldn't have companies like that. It's even more problematic from the perspective of some other company that's trying to compete in the same uh, in the same business. Um, if you have to compete against a company that is is going to be helped out no matter what it does, it really is impossible to compete. So one effect of this is you really interfere with innovation and competition in the marketplace um, when you do these kinds of, of do overs. I focused on another issue, which is if I'm a creditor or a possible creditor, somebody who might be lend, thinking about lending money to a, a business that's in trouble, and I um, am afraid that if that company continues to be in trouble, the government is going to step in and decide who who gets what. I'm really going to think twice about lending to that company. So after the car uh, car maker bankruptcies, uh, the message there, the treatment of creditors in those cases sent was you better not lend to this kind of company because you you your uh your entitlements may be shuffled um by uh, by the government one of the big ironies there is it suggests the more politically sensitive an industry is, the less likely its companies will be to uh, – they'll be less likely to obtain private funding, which is going to create even more pressure for the government to come in again in the future. So what we may be doing in cases like this is creating perpetual bailouts for publicly favored companies. I guess on the other side would be the argument that – well, it's once in a lifetime. It's not that common, politically favored. There only seem to be three politically favored industries, really. That would be financial. I, it's hard to say there's a straight face because there, <laughs> there are three really big industries. That's they're important say, industries. They, they, they only happen to take up 30 or 40 percent <laughs> of the economy. Right. The, well, but they don't. They're, you know, It's the financial sector, insurance slash financial stuff slash real estate and the auto industry. But the fact is, is that if you're – a normal company, quote normal meaning you're not politically favored and you're not very big, uh, you don't get bailed out. You are playing by different rules. Thank goodness. Um, because otherwise we'd be truly on the road to socialism. So the the glass is half full argument is is that, well, you know, although it's deeply disturbing, it's I don't think most lenders are going to assume that that all companies have this kind of uh, political power. They're they're not that many cronies. Almost by definition, 
Oh, I think that's right. But um, they, I mean, I think it is right that there are not dozens and dozens of companies in dozens and dozens of industries. I, mean, I think it's important to recognize that the industries you referred to are, are broader than they might seem at first glance. So when we say the car makers are a favored industry, uh, that raises the question, well, what about car suppliers? Um, they may be a favored industry, too. What about the credit companies? Sure. That that deal with auto loans, they may be favored too. So it it may be slightly broader than it seems. Sure. But I agree with you. This is not the whole uh, the whole industrial landscape. But the problem is, and from my in my view, well, first of all, uh, even if it's not the whole landscape, I think it's a problem. But another problem is there's a there's a a pattern here, I think, and, and the pattern, I wouldn't call it socialism, although it, it could end up in that direction, at least in theory, so much as, as what's often referred to as corporatism. Yeah, uh, crony capitalism. It's crony capitalism, which is, um, which is relatively common in, um, in Europe and, Latin uh, and also in yeah, and, and Asia as well. And the, the kind I'm thinking of is a situation where there's a partnership between the government and the biggest firms in a handful of really key industries, and they do favors for each other. The government uh, protects the car companies, protects the biggest banks. The car companies, the biggest banks, also help out the government when the government has a political objective. And, and so what might that mean? Well, one thing that means in the auto industry is green technology in cars. Yeah. One of the, one of the um, provisions in the Chrysler deal was a, was a provision that gives Chrysler a very big incentive to roll out a green car. It gives Fiat, um, as the new owner of Chrysler, a very big incentive to roll out green cars, and you and you see a lot of that sort of thing where it's not just the government bailing out these industries, but there's a, a we're um, we're we're slapping your back, so you you slap our back. Yeah, for sure. L- let's turn to um, a more theoretical issue, uh, which I'd like to hear the your justification for. Oh, before I do that, I got to ask you one more th- one more thing. I almost forgot uh, Ford. Uh, they didn't get any help. They're doing okay. So it's interesting that they – I think. Maybe they're not, but it seems to me they're doing okay. Uh, so when you talk about the, the difficulties of competing with these government-backed firms, uh, we also know there's some there's some disadvantages to being the government-backed firm. For all, you know, Some are psychological with customers. Uh, some are practical in terms of execution of strategy. Uh, so it's interesting to me that Ford's done pretty well. well I think that is very interesting and, and – um, one way I might put that is it is it is there are some disadvantages to be disadvantages to being a government favored firm as long as not all firms are government favored um, I, I do think that Ford has probably been both helped and hurt by the bailouts sure. it's, it's been hurt because uh, it's not the favored company it's not the one that's getting all these handouts um, but it's been helped because I, I have to imagine folks who are thinking about buying a, an American car are going to be a little more positively disposed towards Ford um, than towards Chrysler or General Motors yeah, I think that's true. The, the theoretical question, the bigger question I wanted to ask you is about bankruptcy itself, which is um, why do we have it? So you've made a case that – and, I, and I, you know, I agree with you 100 percent that, that the, the way that the government intervened in a very uh, – very much against the rule of law in a very ad hoc way is very dist- costly, can, can be very destructive. I think it's going to be expensive in the taxpayer sense. Um, what, what's the virtue of bankruptcy? Why do we have it, and uh, what role does it serve? Uh, this is a great question, and I, I've I only got about twelve minutes. I know you'd like a two or three hour window <laughs> here, but I'm, I'm <laughs> challenging you. I spend a semester teaching my yeah. my students. Get on one foot and tell me. There are a couple of different <laughs> ways to answer it. Uh, I'll, I'll just give. Uh, well, I'll start with one, and that is, um, why do we have the particular bankruptcy system we have, as opposed to to bankruptcy in general? Why do we have a system that uh, that allows troubled companies to be restructured rather than simply um, shut down. And the, the answer to that, I think, 
um, is that there has been a perception for a long time in this country that um, failure in the sense of filing for bankruptcy does not necessarily mean that a business is not viable. Um, and the reason we have bankruptcy is to make the preservation and restructuring of a, an otherwise viable business possible. So that if you look at the, the history of bankruptcy in this country, um, for, for large corporations, it all began with the railroads in the 19th century. Lots of American railroads failed during economic crises. Everybody agreed that it would be a mistake to shut them down, that we needed the transportation. Bankruptcy emerged as a way to make that possible. So, so that would be the, the core of the case. One thing I would, would add to that, um, sort of bringing in a little current bankruptcy theory, the more, the better developed your markets are, and the, the more you have buyers for any kind of assets, the less the old style bankruptcy um, seem, or it, it starts to seem a little bit less necessary. But as I said earlier um, in our discussion, um, I believe that bankruptcy continues to play an important role, even if ultimately what you're doing is selling those assets rather than, than restructuring with them. But the, um, but the original reason for bankruptcy, and in many cases it still is an important reason, is bankruptcy is a way to restructure viable companies that simply have too much debt. But we could imagine a world where that restructuring wasn't available, that if you couldn't keep your promises, you were shut down, your assets were sold off. It would be a role for the legal system, of course, still. There would have to be a way uh, to, to deal with the fact that there isn't enough money to go around and you can't keep all your contractual promises. And your ability as an entrepreneur certainly – corporate entities are a little bit more complicated. But certainly as an entrepreneur, your ability to borrow money would be greatly reduced and more prudent companies would have access to capital and who would provide the guarantees. I assume people – in a world without bankruptcy, would ask for a different set of assurances for their um, for their for their loans. That's exactly right, and uh, uh, you just intuited what I spent about the first five or ten years of my career trying to figure out, um, and that uh, I, I came at it. I was looking at different things, but what I was looking at was bankruptcy across the world. And if you look across the world, um, what you see is that different countries have very different bankruptcy systems, and some countries. Um, this is less true now because a lot of countries have moved in an American direction, but uh, at least 20 years ago, um, many countries had bankruptcy systems that look a lot like what you're talking about, where um, really there wasn't a bankruptcy option. If you defaulted, you were just shut down. And that ends up producing a very, very different business world. You know, it might not be a bad business world, but it tends to be a business world where companies are more uh, prudent, um, established companies have a leg up, there tends to be less innovation, less risk-taking, um, and the, the, the business world just ends up having a different face. Well, I think there'd be less innovation through the corporate structure, right? There might be more innovation elsewhere. There'd be other structures that would emerge or that would do better. I mean, I'm always torn. You know, I was uh, I was trained at the University of Chicago, so <laughs> a part of me says, "Well, this is an old this is my youth. My youth in my youth, it was well, the, whatever bankruptcy law emerges in the United States, that's efficient because there's all these pressures. This is the um, uh, Posnerian school of of law that says, you know, there's pressure on – competitive pressure on judges and there's a marketplace for law and efficiency is what emerges. As I've gotten older, I'm very skeptical of that argument. I don't see any reason for that. I don't see the institutional structures that push that forward. I just might say, well, going back to our earlier discussion of cronies, your corporate uh, entity, you're a stockholder, you are important politically and what bankruptcy law does is – make it easier for you to play the game and it makes it harder for other people to play the game. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I'm not sure what you mean by the makes it harder for other people to um, to play the game, but... Well, if I were... Let's take the United States today. Let, let's say, uh, obviously, there there might, from our earlier discussion, there'd be less innovation and say, within corporate 
structures because people would be very uneasy about their the potential for a company to exceed its – uh, its grasp and suddenly find itself insolvent and then you'd only get a fraction of what you got back and maybe very little and the sort of normal uh, – this reorganization possibility wouldn't be there. You, you might get wiped out. And so you'd probably find yourself investing maybe in a ve- more likely in an angel way, a venture capital way and those s- less corporate-oriented ventures would do better than they would – uh, in the current world, there'd be more capital available in for that that venue. I don't know if that's right. It's my first thought. Yeah, that turns out I think not to be descriptively accurate, and um, and I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's a if there's a connection. I think there probably is, but I'm, I can't see it um, uh, instantly looking at it in in markets or in in countries that have uh, have more draconian uh, approaches to bankruptcy. They don't give you a second chance, an opportunity to restructure, or have historically had those kinds of approaches. Historically, you haven't seen as much innovation. Um, so you think of Japan or Germany, um, which had, had very effective capital markets in many respects, but you don't think of as having as much innovation um, as the U.S. And I, I don't know if there is a if there's a necessary connection um, between the the two, and if there is a necessary connection. It, it may actually have more to do with personal bankruptcy than corporate bankruptcy. Personal bankruptcy because the opportunity to fail and then discharge your obligations and try um, um, try again can be seen as encouraging entrepreneurship. Yeah, I guess my my response to the cross country evidence would be you you have to control for everything correctly, which is impossible, which would include cultural issues character, et cetera. I think there's something potentially unusual about the American yeah, culture. And I, and, and I would add into that um, the kinds of factors that we were loosely describing as, as crony capitalism yep. um, as well, which I, I do think play into that. Relations. But I think what I was saying, I think the, one of the flaws in what I was saying is harder for you to find because it wasn't so clear. But you know, I, I was trying to think of what a – uh, the restructuring. Who? Let me. So let me ask it differently. Who benefits from the fact? Which types of investors and creditors and players benefit from the fact that we have restructuring rather than just an orderly sale? Right? Because you, you you don't really you have to have some legal provision for what happens when you can't keep your promises. What's innovative, it seems to me, about this whole conversation is. In the American system, we have this weird thing where you can sort of reshuffle and try again. Who benefits from that relative to, well, you didn't make it. You're, you're done. We're selling off the assets, and uh, we'll just – we'll deal out what we've got, and then everybody can go – is free to go do what they want with their money and their resources. Well, the short answer to that might be the uh, the folks who are running the company, um, because what invariably accompanies this difference between approaches to bankruptcy we've been talking about is differences in what happens, say, with the managers of a company that defaults. Um, in most countries, the managers are immediately kicked out, um, whereas in the U.S., when a company files for bankruptcy, the the uh, baseline assumption is that the managers will not be kicked out. Um, that has the effect of making managers more willing to file for bankruptcy in the U.S. than they are in other company in other countries. Um, as far as creditors, my guess is that creditors would adjust to either system. Um, you know, they might they might lend in a different way, but you would see roughly comparable yeah. creditors in, in both um, contexts. It may be that it's different from employees' perspective. In the U.S. system, you the U.S. system tends to work um, to go hand in glove with with uh, a high velocity labor market, you yeah. know, a labor market where people don't necessarily stay with the same company for um, for their entire career, but um, but might move from one company to another. Um, so it may be there's some differences there, although uh, it's a little. Uh, it doesn't fit 
completely intuitively with with the bankruptcy system. So I, I think the most um, the most obvious beneficiaries of the U.S. system, in a sense, are, are managers of a company that is financially precarious. So the incentives for innovation are kind of interesting because on the one hand, it says take chances because in the worst case scenario, you, you probably get to keep your job and you can always reorganize if it doesn't turn out so well. On the other hand, it says if you make a bad choice, uh, don't worry. <laughs> and so, yeah, which so it really cuts both ways. Well, it yeah. complicates the innovation side because it, it does suggest that you don't just abandon one idea and move to the next one. My guest today has been David Skeel. David, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, this has been great fun. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.